Hi, my name's Luke and uh, I'm really pleased that we're looking at Nehemiah again at G2. We've looked at it a few times and it's always really helpful when we return to it. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about what the community do after the, re the walls have been rebuilt. How do the community change their behaviour? How do they change how they are all structured and lined up as, as a whole group? They work together. And that's what we're looking at today. It's the unity and the togetherness of the Israelites as they return to Jerusalem, they rebuild and they get stuff sorted again. There's so many messages in this for us as G2, as individuals, but also crucially for us as a community. Now, if you're new to G2, you're in on this as well. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, but listen, I've got three R's to talk to you about today. Um, G2 was originally led by a guy called Jim Roberts. Great guy. Every time he preached, he uses three R's to help you remember it. So that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, firstly, I'm going to talk about remembering. Then I'm going to talk about reordering. And then I'm going to talk about responsibility. Those are the three R's today. Remember, reorder, responsible. Um, I guess it's something like re reduce, reuse, recycle or something. I'm standing... Uh, on the city walls of York, um, walls that were built not very long ago by the Victorians to make them look old. But we're talking today about proper rebuilding of walls that happened in Jerusalem uh, a very long time ago in the time of Nehemiah. So today we're looking at Nehemiah 9 and 10. Well, those are pretty long passages. So I'm just going to highlight a few for you as we go through each R. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins, uh, the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and they read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshipping the Lord, their God. Standing on the stairs of the Levites were Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Bani, Sherebiah, Bani, and Canani. They cried out with loud voices to the Lord their God, the Levites. Jeshua, Kadmiel, Benai, Hashbaniah, Sherebiah, Godiah, Shebaniah, and Pethiah said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You gave life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart to be faithful to you and you made a covenant with him to give his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites and Girgashites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. And so it goes on for the next good few verses. This is a collective remembering. They go through scripture, really. They open the book of the law uh, of God and they start reading. That's the first five books of the Bible, really, the Torah. So they start reading through all that God has done. They remember his faithfulness. They remember his promises. They remember all of the times that they got themselves into scrapes and he got them out. They remember all of the ways in which he is good and he is faithful and he is trustworthy. And basically they put him back in his place. They praise him and they remember the place he rightfully deserves in their life, in their story. They retell their story of where they've come from. This is so crucial to getting a sense of who they are in the present and where they are going to be going. Remembering is so important to us as humans. It's how we know who we are and where we're going to be going. 
is because we know where we've come from. So they do this huge, great big remembering en masse, which is quite interesting, isn't it? That they do that as a group. They don't just do it individually. Now just bear in mind for a second that they've done this huge unified rebuilding of the walls. Um, they're totally amazed that they've managed to do it. So they've done something together and now they're sorting out who they are as a group. So they remember where they've come from and they reset the clocks. It's a kind of a jubilee moment. As they rest, uh, which is another R I suppose, isn't it? Um, they remember uh, on this sort of Sabbath moment where they go, okay, pause for a minute. Let's take stock and remember all that God has done. Part of this is that they remember that they are created to be in community. God is community through the Trinity. That's how God operates and he creates man and woman to live together and to build a family and to have a community. That's how he wants humans to be. So it's no surprise that they operate like this whilst they're getting things right again. We're not meant to do discipleship individually. That is why the church and just the way that the Christian faith operates isn't a load of individuals who live all over the world who just read their Bible every now and again, pray uh, to God and just sort themselves out. It's not how we're meant to do things. We're meant to do things together. We're meant to operate as a community. And of course, individuals have individual faith. That's, of course they do, we all do. And of course it's okay to pray on your own and everything, but it's also good to pray together. It's also good to operate as a unit when we're sorting out who we are. And I think there's spaces for us to do this uh, as G2. It's important to remember where we've come from and what God has done as G2, just like the guys uh, do in Jerusalem after rebuilding the walls. They remember together where they've come from. So I wonder uh, what it looks like for you, um, maybe as we're in this moment where we've sort of come out of lockdown, although I realize maybe we're going back into it in some ways, but we've kind of come out of lockdown. Uh, and maybe there's a moment where there were things that happened in lockdown that God has been good in and he's been faithful in. Maybe there's ways that you want to remember what God has done just in the, in the most immediate um, memory. Or perhaps you want to go a little bit further back and you can remember all God has done over your life. But perhaps you want to do it as a community as well. Maybe there's things as G2 you want to track that God has done and say thank you that he has done. Uh, we used to meet in the David Lloyd gym. Um, we had uh, some cell groups to start with, but we've restructured over the time. It's good to see how God has used changes to bring us as a community closer to him. And I've been amazed uh, over since lockdown, we pretty much all of us found our way into small groups. I think it's nearly 100% of the church into small groups. Those are dynamic when they're good. And I know they're not always amazing, but sometimes they're brilliant, aren't they? And it's us as a community in a small group, we found a way over Zoom of doing discipleship together, of doing real relationship together. But as we go out of lockdown, let's not forget that. And let's try and work out, are there ways in which if we didn't watch it, we would start to just get busy again and we'd start to not prioritize community discipleship together. And we just start to say, well, actually, I'm really busy, so I can't really squeeze in a small group because I've got loads on in my normal life. Are there ways in which we could easily let that slip? I know that's true for me, by the way. I'm not pointing a finger at anyone. We've all got to watch this because lives do get busy, don't they? How do we remember all that God has done together? Small groups are a brilliant place to do that because they're big enough for everyone to speak. It's hard to do this on a live broadcast, isn't it? Everybody can't speak. We can't all see each other, but in a, in a small group, you can. It's so important that all of us have a sense of belonging and community because we're meant to do discipleship together. In chapter nine, verse 38, we see this. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. The next R is to reorder. They make an oath, and they even put a curse over themselves if they break it. So they take it very seriously, and they make an oath that they are going to follow God's law again. 
They're like, let's get this sorted as a group. We've absolutely wrecked it up. So let's get it absolutely sorted again. They've read the story of the, of the uh, Israelites. They've read the book of law. They've remembered. So they've spent time doing that. And now they're going, right, let's reorder this. Let's get it right again. And in order to do that, they realize they've got to make a promise to God. They make an oath. We're not going to do this again. One of them is that they're not going to marry into other tribes. Now, just to say on that, um, that doesn't really make any sense in today's cultural context, of course. Back then it did. The story of God with the Israelites meant that they needed to maintain their integrity as a community in order to put through uh, the identity in who they were so that God's people could then, through the person of Jesus, reach a whole load of other people. But they weren't there yet. Jesus says, doesn't he, like he is the, she the good shepherd and he has many sheep who are of a different pasture. Um, and then through the ministry of Paul and Peter and loads of the other apostles, the gospel spreads throughout the Gentiles, throughout all, the whole known world. And Jesus says, go and spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Right, so we, we know that that's not the message for us today. But the important thing is they knew what they needed to do as a culture to survive. And they let that slip. Their whole identity as a group, uh, as a people of God, had totally slipped because they'd married into all sorts of communities with all sorts of religions and they were following all sorts of gods. So they're getting that sorted. And then they're like, right, we've stopped doing the Sabbath, so let's get that sorted again, because otherwise we're not going to rest and remember and do everything um, really well, like and living life to the full like we're meant to. So let's get that right. There's a whole lot of things that they sort out again, and they promise, right, from now on, we are going to do this differently because um, we keep messing it up without of those things. Now, we've done this as G2. There are, there are times in any church's life when we make changes. And yes, we've changed leadership structures. We've changed um, the way that we're financed. We've changed how we as G2 connect to the Church of England. But that's not the sort of change I'm thinking of. There's changes that we've made in G2's life where it's more like uh, we have clocked oh, wait a minute, we're not really being church in the right way here. Hang on a second, a bit of a revelation. We've dropped this bit and we need to get it back in. We need to reorder who we are so that we get right with God again. So some of the examples that I can think of from the not too distant past, um, there was a time when uh, we looked at generosity. We spoke about being Jesus generous uh, and how some of us uh, just are inclined to just give whatever we think we've got left. And we were like, oh, wait a second. Everything under heaven and earth is God's. It all belongs to him. And throughout the Bible, if we want to talk about tithing, people give their first fruits. In fact, that's in this passage that we've looked at here in Nehemiah. They give their first fruits, so presumably before tax, and it's usually about 20%. If you want to talk about tithing, but actually God says it's, I want it all. I want, your, I want all of your life. That's what Jesus says. I want, I want you to give me everything. But he gives it back to us so we can use it generously. So we looked at Jesus being Jesus generous. That was a thing. It felt to me like that was a moment when we reset the clocks on our generosity. Um, and we gave to church, but we also gave externally. And, and it felt like there was a whole lot of freedom that happened in people when we did that. There was another one when we reset the clocks to do with prayer and we realized, oh, we've not really been praying like uh, we want to. Uh, we haven't been committing everything to God in prayer. So let's get a rhythm of prayer in the life of G2 back again so that it fuels what we do because prayer is what changes things. Prayer is what shifts stuff. It changes us. It does change the, our relationship to God. Maybe it changes the mind of God. Um, there, are thing, there are moments when prayer just is what, we're, what we need to do. Um, so we put that back in again and we started to do the 24-7 prayer weekend things, 24 threes. Um, obviously now in COVID it's slightly different, isn't it? But we still pray and we prayed in, in the thing called gather uh, regularly throughout lockdown. And there will continue to be ways that where we commit ourselves to prayer as a community. That's great. And that's because we reordered. And that's what these, are, these guys here are doing. 
They're getting everything back in shape as a, as a structure so that as a community, as a society, they are focused on God. And finally, the final R is responsibility. In verse 35 of chapter 9, there's an amazing sentence. It says, we assume responsibility. And it's the responsibility for uh, the sacrifices and worship. In other words, for getting it right in the future. They say, okay, we accept responsibility as a community. Now that is a breakthrough line because throughout the Bible, you will find the Israelites blaming other people for the circumstances they're in. You'll find them grumbling, you'll find them struggling, you'll find them arguing, blaming God, blaming other people, blaming circumstances. But here we find this amazing moment where they say, we accept responsibility for getting this right. That is extraordinary. And it's why this moment is a real high point in their lives. So what happens when you accept responsibility is crucial, isn't it? As soon as anyone accepts responsibility for something, there's an activation. There's a freedom. There's a release. As soon as someone's blaming and pointing the fingers and not accepting responsibility, it creates a freeze, doesn't it? It's hard to move on from that moment. You'll know in any relational situation with friends or whatever or family, if someone won't accept responsibility for something they've done, it creates a blockage. You can't really move forward. But if someone will go, I'm so sorry, I totally accept responsibility for that happening, let me make amends, then everybody can start to move. Um, as if you've been in an argument with someone or if you've had a difficult time with someone and they've said, okay, I accept responsibility, it makes you want to move towards them, doesn't it? And, and usually people go, oh, f- thanks. I, in that case, I accept responsibility for this. You know, I could have done this better, to be honest. Whenever we accept responsibility, it brings release in other people, brings freedom. And these guys as a community take responsibility. Um, so... Have you ever thought about um, when you're frustrated, when you're angry? Try and think of something right now that you're frustrated or angry about, something you're really not happy about. Now, it could be something um, really huge, uh, like something that was done to you uh, that was outrageous. It could be something that was said to you. It could be something that was uh, uh, maybe quite small, but it's just niggled away at you and you really feel annoyed about it. So what I've found is if you start a sentence, think of that thing that you're, you're thinking of that you're annoyed about, frustrated about, angry about. Found it? It's not too hard to find something like that, is it? Start this sentence. Say, I am responsible for, and just finish that sentence. That is such a freeing thing to do. I want you to say, I am responsible for, and then just finish the sentence in whatever way you can. What are you responsible for? Now, it could be that something awful has happened to you and been done to you, and you're just going to say, I am responsible for the way that I react, or something like that. But you are responsible in some way. So how's that going to work out? Okay, to summarize, after this amazing time when uh, the Israelites had rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, They'd had this incredible time. They'd been following Nehemiah. That Ezra, the priest, had been leading them um, in re- the public reading of Scripture, and they've confessed their sins. They've remembered all that they've come from. They have reordered their society, and now they've taken responsibility for it as well. So they've activated who they are going to become. That's ace, isn't it? That's brilliant. Nehemiah then goes back to where he's come from. Do you remember, he's come from King Artaxerxes. He was serving that king in another land. So he's been sent back by that king because he's such a good servant. So he goes back to do his job, basically. But then he gets word. And this is what I love. They haven't done it anyway. They've messed up. They've they've not really continued doing all of that stuff. They've done some of it, but they've also let other things slip. So he has to come back again to to Israel and kick their butts and sort them out. And so I love that because we can commit to God again and again. And we will still find ways, because we're human, of messing up again. We will mess up. when We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to get it right and never fail. He knows we will fail. 
And he doesn't mind that as long as we come to him and repent. We remember again. We reorder again. We go, ah, oh, I've let it slip again. Let me get this right. And he doesn't want you to do that and, um, you know, on, on purpose. Like, like Paul says, um, what are we going to do then? Just keep sinning and ask for him to forgive us. No, that'd be ridiculous. But we, we know that we will mess up. God knows that. And he will always forgive us. He will always bring us back. He will continually welcome us with open arms. So that's the place to finish, isn't it? Knowing if, no matter what you've done, God will always welcome you with open arms because he's a good father. Take that opportunity to remember all that he has done in your life. Reorder, make a change if you need to in how your life is structured. And also, responsibility. Take responsibility today for what you are responsible for and do something about it. It's great to look at this story of Nehemiah and I really think it speaks into where we are at as G2. Let's continue to reorder who we are. Let's remember all he's done and let's take responsibility so that we are a church that points towards Jesus, so that we are structured and focused on the person of Jesus and bringing others into community with him. Our small groups are a great place to do that. They're a great way to do it. So make sure you're committed to your small group because it's probably the best place you're going to be in, able to invite somebody into over the next year or so. No matter, who knows how long this whole thing is going to last. Hope that's encouraging. See you soon.